Hello, welcome back to my channel. I'm JC and today's video is going to be a masterclass video. Um, doing Margaret Atwood teaches creative writing um, per the community tab poll. So this is what you guys voted for. And I was thrilled to take the class because I've been putting off her class for a while. I don't know why, but I've been wanting to take her class. Um, I know her writing is a little, she does a lot of um, historical writing, dystopian type writing, speculative fiction. So I was very intrigued to take this class. Um, it was a great class. I got about 15 pages of notes. So um, without further ado, and for the sake of time, <laughs> this is my masterclass experience with Margaret Atwood teaching creative writing. Creativity is one of the essential things about being human. You don't have to apologize for it. It's something human beings do. Sometimes people would say, express yourself. I don't really think that that's necessarily the key thing. Expressing yourself can be shouting in a field. So rather than expressing yourself, why don't you think in terms of evoking, conjuring up for the reader some curiosity, some suspense, some interest, rather than this is my ego. you have a very limited uh, repertoire of tools. Your repertoire is a blank page and some words that you put on it. Uh, so you're not making a film, you don't have sound effects, you don't have actors. You only have those words that the reader is reading. And that's what you use to build everything in your story. It's words. Words on a page are inert. They're like black musical notes on a score. They're inert until the music is played, or in the case of a book, the reader is reading. And when the reader is reading, the words transform back into representations, sounds, smells, colors, people. Reading is the most um, participative of the arts. There's more brain activity when you're reading uh, that kind of intense um, text than there is, for instance, when you're watching television, when you're watching a film, because the brain has to supply everything with the words used just as cues, clues. So what you're providing the reader with is a, is a score, a score that the reader will then interpret. And all you can do as a writer is make your book as good as it can be. You throw it out into the world, hope for the best, and, and that's all you can do. You cannot dictate to the reader how they should read your book or receive your book, because the meaning of a book once it's out in the world is not decided by the writer anymore. Even if the writer has thought the writer was putting X meaning into the book, the reader may have quite a different idea and usually does over time. When I wrote The Handmaid's Tale, I didn't give the central character a name. The readers decided that her name was June. There's nothing in the book that contradicts that. In fact, it all fits. But it wasn't something I thought up. The readers figured it out. It has to be June once you come to think of it, because each of the names that are mentioned in chapter one they all occur again in the book, except for June. I thought that was pretty smart of them. I'm Margaret Atwood, and this is my master class. I became a writer partly, I think, because I was a very early reader. 
and I was a very early reader because I grew up in the North Woods and there were no other forms up there. So no radio, no television, no theater, no cinema, no electricity and no running water. But there were books. We weren't in a village. We weren't in a town. We were actually out in the woods. I was an early writer. I wrote comics and I wrote little stories and I wrote my first novel when I was seven. It was about an ant. It was not a great success, but it, it was illustrated. And then I lost interest in writing. I wanted to be a painter. I started writing seriously again when I was 16. Then I really wanted to be a writer and I thought maybe I would go to journalism school. I was discouraged from that by being told that if I was a female working for a newspaper, I would be writing nothing but the obituaries and the fashion pages. Then I ended up going to graduate school at, at Harvard, which was proposed to me as being better than being a waitress. I would get more writing done that way, I was told, by those who were humoring me. And um, I did have one of my advisors say that I should just forget about this writing and graduate school business and find a good man and get married. But I paid no attention to that. So by this time I was already publishing in small literary magazines and I was already writing the same kinds of things that I have continued to write, namely poetry, fiction and, and non-fiction and um, roughly speaking dramatic works. So I continued doing those things in the world of little magazines and small publishing. I never start with an idea. When people are teaching books, books that have already been finished, uh, then they can talk about ideas because by that time somebody might know what the idea is or what the ideas are. Uh, the way we were taught literature in high school was probably backwards. You were taught that there was this container, the work of art, and inside it there were these ideas like prizes in a Cracker Jack box. But that isn't usually how writers write. They start with characters, they start with voices, they start with scenes. Sometimes my books have started with objects. Uh, and out of that comes a story, because what are novels if not stories? I start with handwriting, because that seems for me to allow more of a flow from brain to hand to page. So I'm, I'm transcribing and typing at the same time I'm continuing to write, and that allows me to remember uh, what I have just written. And when I have about maybe 50, 60 pages, then I can start thinking about structure. As a rule, I work with a lot of post-it notes and end notebooks and those, those afterthoughts get stuck here and there on the desk and then you incorporate them into a draft by more of a downhill skier. I try to go as fast as I can and then I have to backtrack a lot and fill in and uh, revisions and when you revision it you see things that you might not have seen the first time through when you were writing it. If you really do want to write and you're struggling to get started you're afraid of something. What is that fear? Are you afraid that people will laugh at you? Are you afraid that it won't be any good? Are you afraid uh, that your mother will find out? <laughs> what, what is the fear? And identify the fear, look that fear in the face, and there are ways of dealing with all of these fears. If you're struggling, identify the fear and deal with that fear and then that door will open for you. A lot of people think about being writers, but when it comes to actually writing something, they freeze. So it's getting 
getting onto the page. Unless you're writing something on the page, you're not writing. The story needs to have events and it needs to have characters. And any story, even the most elementary stories, which are things like Aesop's fables um, or jokes, you know, they have characters and they have events. A story needs a break in a pattern to get it going. If everything is perfect all the time, there isn't a story. Life is just wonderful every day. So an event uh, of some kind interrupts a pattern and with that interruption the story is kicked off. A good plot has to have something happening in it <laughs> that is of interest to the reader and we hope to the characters. Or maybe I'll put that the other way around. That is of interest to the characters and we hope to the reader. Something has to happen. Blood pressure increasing suspense building plot devices to make us want to know what is going to happen next. The building blocks of story in Western civilization is going to be somewhat different in other cultures, but they all have their own set of building blocks. That's the toolkit, if you like, the toolkit of stories. Think of it as a giant Lego set from which you can build your own structures because the pieces fit together. So for Western uh, cultures, it's going to be Greek and Roman myths. It's going to be folk tales, for instance, the Grimm's collections and people who follow on from that, like Andrew Lang's collection of world fairy tales and folk tales and uh, indigenous stories from North and South America and African stories as well. Uh, so all of these are building blocks of story and the Bible, of course, has some of the fundamental stories that people should know because it's almost impossible to read uh, English literature written before, say, 1940 without encountering biblical references. If you are interested in, in writing and in having a large toolkit of stories, uh, these are some of the things I suggest you can look at because uh, those stories have been building blocks for a great many uh, writers before you. Lesson three, she talks about story and plot. Her definition is stories are patterns that are interrupted. Stories need characters and events, but they um, are mostly a break in pattern. Um, if something was going in a straight line the way it's meant to, there's not really a story there. There's nothing interesting there. It's kind of boring. It's when you break up those patterns of the straight line that the story becomes interesting. So that's the comparison she she used. Um, and for plot, um, she talked about that just being the, the building of, the, of suspense and tension within those breaks in patterns. Um, so basically creating an event that breaks up the straight line but then giving that event some tension and some suspense, you know, to build on that. She did talk about um, using subversion, like taking familiar stories um, in terms of getting ideas for stories. She talked about um, using subversion and taking traditional stories, stories you've heard a thousand times before, and then twisting them and doing them in a different way and um, pulling from pulling from stories and things that you've heard before, but making it your own. So, yeah. next lesson. A 
let's talk about the difference between story and how you tell the story. So the story is what happens. So the plot uh, and the structure is how you tell the story, where you start, what order you tell the events in that's variable. The plot underneath it, however, is the same story. Or you can also have um, the Rashomon approach, which is there is a story there somewhere, but we hear three different versions of it. There's, there's also a device in which you give the reader two possible endings. And that was used by Charlotte Bronte in her novel called Villette. On the one hand, maybe it ended this way, but on the other hand, dear reader, if you're feeling more hopeful, you might prefer this other version. There are many different kinds of ways of telling stories that have been used for generations, but I would never dare to say that there was nothing new under the sun, because as soon as you say that, then there is. If you're just starting out, forget everything I said about all of these different structures and and just do um, a simple telling of your story to see if you can master that part. My first uh, novels were pretty simple in their structure. So The Edible Woman, which is my first published novel, begins at the beginning. It goes on until it reaches the end. And the only change is a part in the middle that's in the third person but the events are told in order. So I would say learn to do that. It's, it's like any other skill. Practicing the skills, if you can get a simple thing to work, uh, then you can start with the variations. But I think with all, with any skill, with any craft, it, it is hands-on learn by doing. And it's also seeing what other people have done. So what are, what are their skill sets? How did they do it? But also what are my skill sets and what am I up to doing right now today? Who are you writing this for and what do you want to tell them? Writing is a voice. It's a, it's a way of recording the human voice. Whose voice is it that is doing the talking? And, and to whom are they speaking? Because there's always someone. So once upon a time, it was either uh, an omniscient third person narrator who would tell you about the characters and tell you what they were doing and in some instances what they were thinking. The he or she, you can either be uh, a narrator taking a long shot and the omniscient narrator knows everything. So you're not necessarily telling all, but you're seeing, you're seeing that encounter through the eyes of one person. You can move it around in whatever way you wish in order to tell your story. We also have a stream of consciousness that entered. It's not exactly a first person narrative, but sort of the flow of ideas that goes through the character's head. There's no rule that says you have to have one point of view. The Sound and the Fury by William Faulkner there are four different narrators and four different points of view. Um, and some of them are first person and some of them are third person. Um, and the perspective keeps getting further and further away. So the, the first word person is, you know, you're smashed right up against that character. You're right in their mind. Uh, and then we, we move back a bit. And by the end, we're seeing an, an overview we're seeing a long view.
when you've decided on your point of view, you have to also make some decisions about what that person is allowed to know, what they can legitimately be expected to know. In, in many situations, the reader knows more than the character, and that's what creates the suspense. In other situations, the character knows more than the reader. That's a, that's a different kind of arrangement. One question you can ask yourself if you're writing, does the reader know more than the character or does the character know more than the reader? Or do they both know the same amount? Because it's going to be one of those three. Lesson five, she talked about um, uh, the narrative point of view, narrative points of view, and it's how important it is to find the, the right point of view for the story that you want to tell but also that sometimes you may not have the right point of view to start off with. You can start a story and end up 30 pages in and realize you're telling it from the wrong narrative point of view. Um, she talked just talked about also using, um, using stories with multiple points of views. She talked about um, the narrator obviously needing to know more than the reader, but... Um, sometimes the narrator needing to know more than the character themselves if you're using a narrative voice that's omniscient um so they would know something that the character doesn't know yet and just mainly emphasized how um you shouldn't get so stuck or set in using a particular point of view um or narrative voice that you can't find your way to change course if you you see that it's the wrong one that you're using don't be afraid to change the narrative point of view next lesson which comes first character or story there there's no such thing as first because because a person is what happens to them. Um, so a novel is uh, characters interacting with events. So characters don't, don't just exist in, in isolation. You're, you're finding out who they are through how they interact, through the decisions they make, through how other people treat them, through how they react to how other people treat them. All of these, these interactions that, that change us that reveal us to ourselves, that reveal us to other people, and therefore to the reader. You don't know necessarily uh, what new facets of your character are gonna reveal themselves until you put them in new situations. How do we know what we know about characters anyway? How do we know what we know about people? There's the impression you have of them, and then there's the impression that you feel they are trying to create. And then there's the impression that other people have of them in the book, within the book. Um, so you may think they're quite charming. And another character, someone in the book, may have a jaundiced view of that person. So their actions, um, what other people say about them, which may or may not be true, and what they themselves say, which may or may not be true. And then our own ruminations and thoughts about them. We're gonna to wanna to know how old they are. So when is their birthday? What are their friends like? What are their hobbies? Have they had any traumatic experiences? Do they have maybe some obsessions? Are they in love? So all of these things can be part of building your character. Here's something that I like to do when I have a novel that's taking place over time and therefore is set in the past and involves a number of characters. I like to write the months of the year down the side of the page on the left-hand side. I like to write the years across the top and I like to put in the characters' birth dates and also important world events that happened so that I always know how old they are in relation to one another in any given year and what was happening in that year 
uh, and how old they were when those things were happening. And you also know how old they are in relation to important world events. So how old was your character on 9-11? If they were 12, that probably made a pretty deep impression on them. If there were two, it probably didn't. All of those things you like to know about their about their background, you can keep uh, control of them with, with a handy chart like that. In lesson number seven, she talked about bringing characters to life through details, um, giving them background, backstory, giving them traumas, giving them hobbies, obsessions, um, knowing how they dress, um, the particular style, one character dresses as opposed to the style of the side characters or, you know, um, the secondary main character, the their friends and their friends' hobbies and what, um, how the, the interaction between the characters, the details of interaction between the characters and um, the moods that the characters inhabit. Is is a character always sad? Is there, are they always happy? Are they depressed? Um, these things, knowing these things can change how you write that character. She suggested making a chart. She actually, um, in her workbook on the class, she actually has a chart, um, which I think I will be using going forward, uh, which is very helpful of different questions to pose for your characters, um, to kind of pull those answers to those questions to get to know the characters even better. Um their personalities and, and such. So, yeah, next lesson. So the question that, that people uh, in books should be really nice people all the time, and that women in particular ought to be very well behaved. Uh, first of all, it's not real life, as we know. And second, women come in all shapes and sizes, ages and stages, heights and colors and different parts of the world. And to expect or demand that they be angelic and perfect is very Victorian. When you're writing, you're going to be looking at how people in the world you're writing about, if it's the present age uh, or if it's the 50s, those are two very different periods, how they are performing gender, which is always to a certain extent of uh, a way of presenting yourself in society to other people. What am, what am I conveying um, to other people about myself by this performance? <laughs> What makes a compelling villain? So I, I think really it's a question of if, if, if you don't quite know what a character is going to do next, think of some of the noteworthy villains. Surprise me. And if you're surprising me, you're engaging me. If your surprise is convincing. Likeability is, is a factor when you're choosing a roommate. But it's not necessarily a factor when you're uh, creating a living character. You will find people saying the central character isn't likable. And you'll find other people saying um, that's not the only criterion. So a character can, can be very vibrant and alive, although not likable. So think of the people in your life. Think of the people that you're interested in hearing about. What have they done now? What have they got up to now? Dangerous and unstable characters, characters we can't necessarily predict, characters that we don't know whether they're telling us the truth or not, they hold our attention. become a writer by writing. There is no other way. So do it, do it more. Do it again. Do it better. Fail, fail better. 
I think it's a good idea, especially when you're, you're younger to keep your hand in by writing something every day. So I recommend it, but it's another of those recommendations that I myself, um, have been unable to follow. I think it's a, it's a question of being able to improvise your time. You have to be prepared to be interrupted. A lot of things that, that, that interest me involve problem solving. I still paint myself into a corner and then try to figure out how to get out of it. <laughs> so a lot of it is a bit like that, but it's also, I think just, just the process, which has always made me quite happy and, um, involved me quite deeply. If you're encountering, a, um, a blockage, I won't say a block, but a blockage, uh, there are two things you can do. One of them is go for a walk. This is a well-known ancient remedy. Uh, and the next one is go to sleep. So tell yourself the problem, go to sleep. When you wake up, you may well have the solution. It's always better to actually do something, you know, sit down at the keyboard, pick up the pen, rather than to brood about the fact that you're not doing it. Do it however crummy you may think the result may be. At least you're moving. I think if you're writing, it's important to write something to keep your hand in power, just to continue the process of, of writing. And a lot of it may be stuff you don't use or throw out, but the, the mere fact that you are um, that your mind is engaged with it and that you're working on something. Now, some of it is, is like spinning your wheels, which you can do in either snow or mud. And you don't always know that that's what it is until you step back and look at this and say, where is this going? You know, what is the story? What is the story the person is, is telling any form of human creativity is a process of doing it and getting better at it. Writing people, um, and it's a lucky thing about, about writing. Um, they don't usually peak in their twenties. It's usually quite a lot later on. Why is that? Because writing is about people and stories about people and you know more about people and their stories as you get older, you just learn more, you hear more stories, you see more, you experience more. If you're going to have your characters talking to one another, it should be for some reason, not just to have them chattering away. When people talk, it's, there's usually quite a lot of padding and verbiage, pauses and ums and ahs and you know and like. Dialogues in, in books are much, uh, much more selective. They're usually trying to find out something from the other person or they're making some social move. So how people talk and what they say in a book is, is indicative of who they are, of course. It has to be consistent with who they are. But it's also telling the reader things that the reader needs to know, but most particularly what their intention is in talking to this other character. What are they trying to achieve? What is their goal? It's hard to speak about someone's tone of voice or their voice apart from what's happening to them and who they are. So you need to know who they are. You need to know um, where they're living, what their social level is, what sort of vocabulary would be available to them, how they talk, what's their level of, of, of speech, what is their local dialect. Words and phrases come in and out of fashion. So if you're uh, setting your 
dialogue in the past, you should, um, you should be accurate to something people would actually have said then. The conversations in books need to be specific to the time that you're writing in without being um, overly researched. In lesson 10, she talked about crafting dialogue and she talked about the differences of real life conversations versus dialogue that you would find in a book or a script. Um, because how you hear people talk in real life is not how you would write the dialogue in a book. She was saying that um, uh, the dialogue is subjective. What the characters say to another character can can be different. You also have to make sure that you craft the dialogue of one character in such a way that you're not confusing the other characters. Um, they each need their own way of talking where the reader instant instinctively knows that it's this character, not this character. They, they don't sound alike. Um, also, if you're writing a period piece or some a story that's um, historical in nature, you also have to make sure that your dialogue fits the time period that you're writing in. If you're writing about a different culture, immerse yourself in that culture to know dialect, tone, how they talk, the tone of their conversations, um, the tone when they're angry, the tone when they're happy. You know, it, it shifts, it changes. So she discussed a lot about that. Um, Thanks, Lexi. I think a lot of people see things in quite general terms. That is, they see a tree and they say, it's a tree. So you might just try a few meditations. Take a tree. What kind of tree is it? Just for starters, how is it growing? Where is it growing? Um, what state is it in? Because everything is is particular. I think we we do tend to generalize and and abstract. So instead of a middle aged lady, which middle aged lady? Well, what do we mean by that? We're, we're very fond of labeling and abstracting, but that doesn't work very well in fiction. Moving up to the next level, um, texture of meanings. So um, the different senses. So sight, smell, taste, sound, touch, um, textures of fabrics. When you, when you look at different languages, you will find that some of them are very specific. They have very specific vocabularies for, for certain types of texture and look, uh, that they do just with one word. So Japanese, for instance, is very interested in textures of cloth. And they have one word that means the texture of a piece of white silk bleached on the snow. These are the things that fill our world. Smooth table, slightly rougher book, shiny piece of glass. So how much of that do you want to put in? Um, hot, cold, warm, humid, dry, all of those things. Is the, that's the world we live in. So you're situating your characters in this world you probably uh, want your textures surrounding them to, to be meaningful in some way. So if you're doing a night journey filled with possible trolls, <laughs> presumably you're going to have your character be very alert. You're going to be very alert to sounds. Uh, in particular, they're going to be very alert to um, light, there won't be much of it, but what can they see? Is there a looming shadow? Is there a smell that indicates a, a foreign presence is nearby? 
you get very alert at such times. So uh, all of these sensations are, are feeding in to us, we human beings, all the time. You, you don't really notice them unless you have a reason to. of language are, are words, phrases, sentences, paragraphs, etc. But at the, at the micro level, they are letters and sounds. And part of texture is, um, is how, those, how those words sound. It's, it's very useful to read your text out loud to see how it, how it sounds, because a text is a score for voice. That's the, the basic thing about texture. How does it sound? How does it sound when you read it out loud? So at the extremes, you can say that there are two kinds of style. One is plain song, in which the sentences are fairly short. They don't have a lot of adjectives and adverbs. They're fairly uh, blunt and straightforward. The other you can call Baroque, in which the language is very ornamented. So it could have a lot of subordinate clauses. It could have a lot of adjectives and adverbs. It could have a kind of pile on of, of detail, a pile on of, of syllables. And most people are somewhere in between there. There is no one good style. Uh, some people have, they have styles that they prefer. So it is a question of what you're using your language for. What sort of, let us say, what sort of spell you're trying to cast, or what kind of illusion you're uh, trying to practice. <laughs> novel is about time. Um, you cannot write a novel that does not involve time in some way. Time passes. In a lyric poem, maybe not. That could be about a timeless moment. But in a novel, time happens, people change, things, um, the clock hands move, or at least the digital ticks happen. <laughs> but there are two ways of viewing time. One is circular and one is linear. So the circular kind of time revolves, and that's where we get um, analog clocks. That's where we get sundials. That's where we get the idea that there are seasons that keep moving around, lunar cycles, they're circular. The other way of viewing time is that it's linear. It begins at the beginning, Garden of Eden. It ends at the end, Book of Revelations. Uh, and you go from here to there. there. There's nothing about human history that is inevitable. What kind of time, however, are you going to have in your novel? Your choice. How do you indicate to the reader when you're moving from the present to the past and vice versa? Well, there's a number of pretty obvious devices. You can simply put the time. A lot of people do that. So May 1940, um, April 1977, you, you can do that. Uh, you can put in some indicators. Clothing is always a pretty good clue. The simplest way, if it's a, if it's a time sensitive structure is simply to put the date. That's not hard. Just as it's, it's, if you're changing person, put their name and I'm keen on maps. If it's an historical drama that, um, requires a lot of moving around. So where would we be in Lord of the Rings without those maps? We like to know where things are, and that too is a very old um, device. The 
problem with flashbacks is that you can't make them too long or tedious. So too much exposition, explanation, and we kind of nod off. Tell us what we really need to know in as engaging a way as you can so that we don't nod off. Um, but unless you begin with something that's going to hold our attention, um, we may not stay with you. Leaping around in time. Well, I think you're going to have to ask yourself why you want to do that. So it's, it's the same as any of these things. Is it going to work with your story to do that? with the story that you are telling. So there, there aren't any abstract tips as such. I think, it, again, it's a matter of try it this way. See if, see if it works for your story. And if it doesn't, the waste paper basket is your friend. Um, lesson 13, she talked about working with time and fiction. Um, if you're using, um, well, the first thing she said in this lesson was the novel is about time. You can't write a novel that time is not involved in. Um, so basically keep track of the time period your novel, unless your novel is spanning the course of 10 years, um, which would be a little more relaxed. But if your novel is going over the course of a year, then you need to keep a, a accurate time for when things are happening. How many months did this happen from when this event happened? Um, just to not confuse the reader, I'm really bad at keeping time, which is why I'm so glad she included a worksheet in her workbook um, for keeping track of time. She actually tracks her character's birthdays. Um, and she tracks them in relation to events that happen in the world um, to see if like if this event happened in the world and you were born before this date how would this character have lived or if this character was born after this date how much different would life be for this character or would things be in this character's world because after this event happened and um and then again, for her historical period pieces, she, you know, would do research of that time period. She also talked about using flashbacks. And if you're going to use flashbacks to make them compelling, um, not too long and not too tedious, to also figure out in this flashback, if you're going to use a flashback, is it information that the reader actually needs to know? Can you tell the story without using a flashback? Or can you tell the story within the story without using a flashback? Sort of thing. Thanks. Thanks, awesome. The single shortest, best opening sentence of a novel, in my opinion, is Moby Dick. And those three words are, call me Ishmael. So what's packed into those three words? His name isn't Ishmael. Why does he want you to call him that? You have to think about then who Ishmael is, who this character is representing himself as. Ishmael is an outcast, uh, and but he is an outcast who is favored by angels. Okay, so that's two things about Ishmael. Call me Ishmael. Who's he speaking to? He's speaking to the reader. He's speaking in the present tense so that we know whoever else goes down with the ship, it's not going to be him. If you cannot get that reader through the first page, they will never read the brilliant insights into life that are on page 75. So what you want on the first page is something that is going to beckon the reader in. The first page is a gateway. It's a door. It's a door into the book. And that's why the first page, in fact, the first five pages have to be a good entryway into the book. Tell me more. This looks like a really interesting setup. Tell me more, but don't tell me too much more. And don't overload me with information in those first five pages. Lead me through the doorway. 
and leave enough hooks there so that I will want to read on. Every reading of a book is a journey of discovery and, and surprises. You're going to find out things that you were not told on the first page. And you're going to find out that some of the things that you think you know in the first 20 pages are not as you thought they were. That is certainly what I'm looking for in a book. Surprise me. of the book, always the most difficult part. You've got the beginning, you have an inkling of what the end is going to be, but how are you going to get through the middle? More to the point, how are you going to get the reader through the middle? So in the days when uh, novelists were writing in serial form, each set of three chapters or so had to end on a, and what next? What is going to become of these people? Something has gone off the rails and needs to be resolved. How are you going to get your characters out of the difficult situations we hope you have put them into? What they say about, about writing longer books, not poetry, but longer books, fiction, non-fiction memoir. It's, it's one part inspiration and nine parts perspiration. So writing is work. It's something you, you work away at. And that includes scratching things out, uh, moving parts of it around, making it better. There's no shame in backtracking. There's no shame in revision. There's no shame in realizing that you, you got it wrong. Um, or that there's a better, that there's a better thing that you can do. It's better than what you have done. The ending that you think is going to be the ending is often not the ending. And of course, it's quite usual for you to write the ending sometime before you actually write the part leading up to the ending. That's normal. As you approach the end of the book, your writing pace can get quite a lot faster if you know what ending you were you were heading towards so you can actually find yourself writing quite a few more hours a day than than you did at the beginning when you're working things out and, and thinking a lot rather than necessarily just writing i think the lesson is to, to get the book finished and then and then read it through and if it goes too fast at that at that point add more in Remember, there's always revision. Lesson 14 and 15, I kind of lumped them together. Lesson um, 14 was about the door to your book, the importance of the first five pages, um, how you have to hook the reader in. She also stressed that sometimes you are not going to get the beginning of your book right on the first shot. Um, you may write the beginning of your book and then by the time you get to chapter two or chapter three, realize that that's the real first chapter or that's how you should really start your book. Um, and she said, it's okay, obviously, to change your mind and you can always replace, you know, and take whatever you had as the first chapter and put it somewhere else in the book or scrap it all together. Um, she liked to say throughout the class that the wastebasket is your friend, the trash is your friend. I am not of that belief. I don't throw anything out right away. It may all be filed away somewhere in some file or some folder on my shelf to use at another time, but I never throw anything away. But she believed in throwing things away. Um, and lesson 15 was about writing the middle and the ending, um, keeping your readers engaged through the middle. You know, she talked about the middle being the hardest part. She says in the middle, just remember that the story should always have something that still needs to be resolved because you're in the middle of the story. It can't be over yet. And, you know, when you get to the end, she talked about the difference between having open endings and closed endings and, 
you know, people who are writing more series type books usually would have a open type of ending so that you can know that there's something else coming to expect. She also said to keep in mind when you're doing the ending of the story to think about what your readers expect from the end of the story. Like, are you giving them what they expected? Are you trying to give them what they expected? Or are you trying to give them something they never expected? You just think about those things. Next lesson. <laughs> There's something called completion fear. Completion fear is I'm afraid to finish it because what if it's not any good? And you could get stuck in that for some time. And you are just say, barrel on through, get it done. And then you can see whether it's what else it might need. And remember, you can always revise. So overcome your completion fear and just finish. What do you do next? Pretend you're a reader. Start on the first page. Is it a good enough first page to hold your attention? Are you going to turn the page or not? Uh, if the answer is not, you need a different beginning. Seeing the book anew, seeing into the book more, questioning yourself. Why did this person do that? So why else did they do that? And why else in addition to that did they do that? Once you feel there's nothing else that can that you can do to your manuscript to improve it, you want somebody who can who can give you a true opinion, and that allows you to step back. It allows you to see it through the eyes of another person. If there's something that you thought was quite clear but they find unintelligible, they will tell you that. Um, if there's a piece of information missing that they felt they really needed to know, they will tell you that. Uh, they will also tell you this chapter is too long. Or you already said that. Or I got it the first time. The best thing is, how quickly did you read it? If the answer is I couldn't put it down, then you're in really pretty good shape. And just remember when push comes to shove, the bug stops with you. So whoever's advice you may have taken, uh, whatever alterations may have been made, what is on that page is going to be considered your work. So there's speculative fiction and there's science fiction. And there's science fiction fantasy and there's fantasy. And you might put them all under a big umbrella called Wonder Tales. So Wonder Tales are not um, naturalist. They're not the world that we uh, find ourselves in here and now today. Speculative fiction is a way of dealing with possibilities that are inherent in our society now, but which have not yet been fully enacted. If you're interested in writing speculative fiction or even um, science fiction, look around you uh, at what's happening in the world. Read some newspapers. Often the back pages of the newspapers or even a magazine like a New Scientist or a Scientific American uh, will open the doors to some of the things that people are working on right now, but may not have succeeded in, in, in doing yet, but it does show what they're interested in, in achieving. Speculative fiction is fiction, and therefore all the rules that apply to writing fiction, including making it interesting, making it plausible, making it accurate um, to itself, um, all of those things apply to it. Just because it's speculative fiction does not mean it's going to be automatically interesting. If you're writing speculative fiction or science fiction, you can't violate the rules that you yourself have set up. A 
are there some themes that are common to speculative fiction? It depends whether the speculative fiction is a utopia or, or a dystopia. So in a, in a utopia, you're portraying a world that is supposed to be better than the one we live in. And in a dystopia, you're portraying a world that is supposed to be worse than the one we live in. So a single person alone on an island is not a dystopia. Dystopias and utopias are all about societies so groups of people either living better or living worse. And it's also true that one person's utopia is going to be another person's dystopia. I think if you research too much ahead of time, it's going to clog things up. Um, you find out such interesting things that you long to put them in, but quite frequently they're, they, they sidetrack the plot. So you want the details to be accurate, but you don't want them looking like research. So I like to write first and then uh, research the details that I've put in to see if I've got them right. I, I find that much more helpful than having a huge um, stack of research that can bog you down, if you like, and, and slow up the, the actual writing. It's important to get those details right because if you get them wrong, it throws off the reader's belief in your story. So it's best to check your facts and factoids. internet is your friend mostly, um, just as the reference library is your friend mostly. But just because it's on the internet or because it's in the reference library doesn't mean it's true. It's always good to cross check and use mo more, more than one reference. Uh, lesson number 20 is about research and historical accuracy. I think I kind of touched on this in the one about time, but she basically was like saying if you're going to write a story even if it's fiction based on an actual event loosely based on or tightly based on an actual event that happened in the past you need to get it right you need to research 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 um if you can't do the research hire someone else to do the research um she did a story called um uh, elias grace that was actually based on something that happened. Um, I forgot what century she said it was in, but she actually had to have a researcher do in-depth research, um, go to the town and do in-depth research and catalog and cataloging and things like that. And you want to get the time period right. You want to get the way things were done back then right. You want to um, get the clothing all of that stuff. Um, she actually said, leave no stone unturned. Fact check everything because there will be someone who will point out where your inconsistencies are and just to make sure that it's accurate. Um, yeah, next lesson. I don't think the writing life is like deciding you're going to be a lawyer or a dentist. It's it's not that kind of a decision. I think it's it's something that you already uh, you're already on that path before you know it and, and you discover it. If you have to stand back and say, should I be a writer or should I not be a writer? Um, if, if you're doing that, then the answer is probably I should not be. Most writers don't make a living out of their writing. Don't forget that many well-known writers had other jobs and I just always assumed I would have another job. I didn't think I was going to have a career as a writer. That, that did happen, but it wasn't anything I ever thought. 
and there weren't any manuals of instruction about how to manage your career challenges. Because let's face it, it's not easy. It's not an easy life. It's, it's like people who want to be an actor. Do they know how hard that is? You have to really want it. Some extremely successful books were rejected by numerous publishers before somebody finally saw the beauty of them. And one of those was the Harry Potter series, which was, I think, 20 publishers or something turned it down. And another one was Malcolm Lowry's Under the Volcano. Um, this happens. Not, not everybody can see immediately uh, that this is a wonderful thing to publish. The Bronte sisters were very discouraged originally with their collection of poems. Um, the reviewing history of Jane Eyre and, and Wuthering Heights is, is very interesting. So Wuthering Heights, now universally acknowledged as a work of genius, was, was um, scorned by many, especially when it turned out that it had been written by a, a woman, which was, was then considered very immoral. I'm nearing the end of my trajectory. So this is sort of my last shot at um, here are some things that maybe you down the line may find useful because it's unlikely that I will be traveling the world saying these things for very much longer. I sometimes say this to rooms full of young people. I, I say, uh, climate change is going to be your problem, but it's not going to be my problem for very much longer. Here's, here's a package that I can put some of these things into, pass them along without having to teach in a So thank you for staying with me for all this time and good luck with everything that you're doing and fair enough. And there you have it. Um, my masterclass experience with Margaret Atwood. Um, I enjoyed this class a lot. Um, it, I won't say that it's my favorite, but I got a lot out of this class, especially in terms of speculative fiction and writing dystopian or utopian type of novels, which um, I can't say that I ever thought about the possibility of doing before this masterclass. So now I have some ideas. My interest has been piqued. So that's going to be it for this video. If you like what you're seeing, want to see more videos from me, make sure that you hit the like and subscribe button. I post videos on Mondays and Thursdays and I live stream on Wednesdays from 6 to 8 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. I will be leaving a poll, another poll on the community tab for the suggested next masterclass. So look out for that and you can get a vote and have your say in which class you want to see me take next. As for usual, if you would like to support me in any of my creative endeavors, such as my blog site, my online magazine, my online store, or my Kofi page, all of those links can be found in the description box below. And until next time, have a blessed day. Bye.